I'm Margarita Coppolito. My pronouns are she, her. For people who don't know me, it's a great pleasure to be your moderator and facilitator for today's forum. Just a few um, housekeeping. Today's session, we are talking about mental health. Um, so then maybe we are having people with lived experience uh, talking. So there is a whole list here that we will have in the chat for general services if people get triggered. Uh, and we will keep talking about that. We've asked the presenters if they're talking about anything that will trigger to, to pre-warn so people can choose whether they want to stay on the forum while conversations are being had. So I hope everybody's okay with that so that we can make today as culturally safe for everybody. Now, normally in housekeeping, we say the toilets are to the left to the right, but today we're actually all zooming in. So you know where your uh, housekeeping toilets are in your location. Hope you don't mind a bit if you are not. Always good. But first and foremost, as the incoming uh, Prime Minister said, on the election night, he acknowledged the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands. We are going to do the same. I was very pleased when he said what he said. I begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, which we are all meeting today via your traditional day, and pay my respects to their elders and present. I extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands who may be amongst us at this Zoom today. Um, it would be really nice if people can put their, uh, where they are, what land they're on in their profile or your name. So that way, because we just don't have time to go around and acknowledge each of the land. The forum today, is we're going to have a couple of organisations present, then we'll have a vote. So we'll make sure that there are votes and then we're going to have people with living experience. There will be a Q&A, what we would encourage people to do, just so that we can get around to everybody, because you know two hours is not a lot, long time. If you can put your questions in the chat and we will do everything we can to make sure that those questions get asked. Um, and rules. Uh, as I normally say, please don't speak over people. This is about creating a culturally safe space. We hope you enjoy the lineup of the people we have today. And I, without further ado, would like to now hand it over to the CEO of ECCB, Matapal. Over to you. Good morning. Thank you so much, um, Margarita. Uh, good morning and welcome, everyone. I would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which I speak, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. I would also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal people who might be here today and thank them for welcoming us to this unceded land, which always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I would also like to acknowledge people here with a lived experience of discrimination. I thank your strength and resilience. Uh, uh, I thank you for your strength and resilience and for courageously sharing your stories so that we might learn and together um, build a better society for everyone. I would also like to acknowledge our distinguished guests, Margarita Coppolino, Joseph Schwartz, Pinar Takir and Betsy Rajan, Christian Astorian, Nerub Majak and Yuli Kaplan. They need no introduction and with some of them, ECCB has enjoyed a fruitful long-term collaboration. Thank you all for making the time to be here today. I'm very much looking forward to working with you for many more years to come. My name is Emiliano Zucchi. I'm the relatively new CEO of the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria. Prior to working at the ECCB, I was a director in a public health service where I looked after the language services and Aboriginal support unit. Diversity and intersectionalities have always been very, very close to my heart. As you know, the ECCB is the voice of multicultural Victoria. We strive to advocate for human rights, 
freedom, respect, equity, and dignity for multicultural communities. We tirelessly work towards an inclusive and socially cohesive society. We are very happy today. Uh, we are very happy today to be hosting this forum with the State Disability Network. Funded by the Victorian Office for Disability and shared by Margarita, the Statewide Disability Network is an ECCV-led initiative run in collaboration with Action on Disability within Ethnic Communities, better known as ADEC, and Diversity and Disability, better known as DND. Since its establishment last year, this network has addressed key advocacy issues to support COVID-19 recovery for people with disability from migrant and refugee communities, including the vaccine rollout, lack of accessible health information, and service navigation issues caused, caused or exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The forum today will address the intersectionality between disabilities and diverse backgrounds in the context of the pandemic. I'd like to make some introductory points. Although the Victorian government hasn't released specific subgroup data, it is obvious from infection distribution maps that the COVID-19 hotspots are located in lower socioeconomic suburbs that are culturally and linguistically diverse and have a large newly arrived migrant community. The COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted many aspects of our daily lives, but its impacts are especially acute for people living with disabilities. <clears throat> For so many, living with a chronic illness and or disability is a battle each and every day. Whether it is through challenges with mental health, chronic illness, or some other form of disability, the need is greater than ever for awareness of and adv advocacy for those individuals. 15% of, of the world's population have some form of disability. 4.4 million or one in five people in Australia have a form of disability. 35.9% of Australia's 8.9 million households include a person with disability. We are all touched in some way by disability. What's said, incredibly said, is that 32% of adults with disability experience high or very high psychological distress compared with 8% of the general population. Unfortunately, there isn't much evidence-based research about low utilization rates of disability services by people with disabilities from cold backgrounds. But we know from the communities and service providers we work with that this is the case. Reasons include reluctance to recognize disability and or accept formal services, lack of awareness and understanding of the services available, language barriers, poor cultural relevance, and a lack of availability of services in rural and remote areas. Carers, generally speaking, experience pressures, including poverty, poor levels of health, uh, and well-being, lower levels of access to services in rural and remote areas, and reduced workforce participation rates. In addition to these factors, carers from cold backgrounds may also be affected by cultural factors, including difficulty with the English language, different cultural beliefs about the type of personal care that can be provided and by whom, varying levels of knowledge and understanding about available services, a reluctance to use services and support, and care being shared among the extended family so that there is more than one primary carer. And finally, some mistrust of service providers. Every day, people with disabilities encounter challenges while carrying out their daily life activities. Compared to the general population, individuals with disabilities have a higher risk of depression, lower life satisfaction and increased loneliness. 
people with disabilities were already considered a marginalized group pre-COVID. COVID-19 has amplified the daily difficulties. Given the dependence on services and others to meet specific needs and their increased susceptibility to COVID-19, people with disabilities are considered most vulnerable in an environment an environmental crisis. We know barriers have worsened for cold people with a disability during COVID-19, and they must be considered as part of our crisis management planning moving forward. Today is an opportunity to hear from the, from the lived experience and professional experts to understand the mental health impacts of the COVID pandemic for people with disability and look to how we can use this information to continue to advocate to reduce barriers and increase access for migrant and refugee communities across Australia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Now I'm going to introduce our first speaker and I'm going to present to office. Now I, one of my intersectional learnings, I actually have dyslexia, so sometimes I struggle to say particular words or things correctly. So if I mispronounce people's names, please excuse me. Um, I'm not doing that, so it's just part of my, one of my disabilities. So having said that, Jeffers is a senior policy, uh, senior policy and advocate at the Victorian Foundation for Survivors of Torture, Inc. Foundation Hearts provides specialist services to advance health, well-being, human rights of people from refugee backgrounds who have experienced torture and other traumatic events. I'm just turning over my notes. Uh, their country of uh, orange and by fleeing from countries. At Foundation House, a key focus of their policy work in recent years has been the Royal Commission into Victorian Mental Health Services and, and has implemented the reforms recommendations of the, by the Commission. That has a significant role in the Foundation House research activities which primarily seeks to improve the accessibility and responsive of health services to people of refugee background. The office will actually present for approximately 15 minutes and then we'll do a Q&A um, after that. So over to Jeff, it's lovely to welcome you over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> and thanks ECCV for creating this uh, terrifically important opportunity and uh, for your excellent overview, Emiliano, which has taken uh, maybe 10 minutes off me going over time. Uh, so I, I think there's going to be a lot of intersectionality between the different presentations, uh, which is a very strong point. So uh, I've got some technical support. So can you? I'm sorry, this slide has come out a little bit small. See the screen, Joseph? I can see the screen. Thank you. Um, okay, so this first slide is an image uh, that someone created based on the characters uh, from Winnie the Pooh and Piglet, one of his friends. A book of about 100 years uh, with very profound insights into friendships, family, connection. And I was very struck by that image. I'll read it out very quickly. Hey, Pooh, said Pooh. Yes, Piglet, the same thing seems to be going on forever. You mean the pandemic thing? Will it ever end? I hope so, Piglet. I do too. I miss so much. What do you miss? Hugs, Pooh. I miss hugs. Yep, it's the one thing the humans were good at. I know, Piglet. I know. What brought that image to mind is really... Uh, one of the clients that one of my colleagues told me about, about the impacts on our clients um, of the pandemic. This client is Samira, a woman in her 60s of Syrian origin. She left with her husband from Turkey to escape persecution, lived there for about 20 years in a situation of marginality, 
he died not long before she was granted permission to come to Australia, and not long after that, COVID hit. Combination of physical and other issues make her very housebound. Her children spread all over the world, very common of the refugee experience. So profound isolation, a woman with little English cut off. One of the key impacts of COVID and the impact of all of her other background issues is isolation and the impacts that, that has on her mental well-being. Very, very profound. Empty hours at home alone to dwell on the traumatic experiences and losses that she has suffered. With counselling support and the easing of some restrictions, my colleague, the counsellor, was able to get her into some classes, both English language and some art classes, which is something that was really important to her as a young woman. So she's got some social connections and she's beginning to find her way out of this terrible situation that she finds herself. And the art classes, she paints alone at night rather than just dwelling without sleep. So the impacts of COVID on all of us have been very profound. And as Emiliano pointed out, the impacts of intersectionality of other background factors makes it an inequitable disease. Uh, for reasons to do with our biology, our aging, but also for reasons to do with the way in which services operate. Governments were slow to react and not always appropriately, as we know. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. This is just a, a snap of a newspaper. The headline reading, police presence at Melbourne Towers was dehumanizing, infectious disease doctor says. Uh, this is a very um, well-known event in Melbourne, though I fear receding in memory, with many, many people from diverse countries suddenly locked up in their apartments with very little warning a little ability to make preparations. What do I do for my appropriate food? Where am I gonna get my medications? How do I manage all of these things? Next slide, please. That's from a report that the Victorian Ombudsman did into the way the, the towers were locked up and the impacts of the people. And the Ombudsman had it published in many languages, which were the languages of the people who were affected. So the Ombudsman was very sensitive to the inequitable impact of this event. Could I have the next slide, please? This is a quote from the Ombudsman's report which is particularly pertinent to the clients with whom we work. And many of our clients were people who were in the towers. A significant proportion of tower residents came from non-European backgrounds. Some had endured civil wars and dictatorships before settling in Australia. Some even surviving torture at the hands of their former state. For them, the overwhelming police presence was particularly traumatic. Their distress when they spoke to us was palpable. This was very striking for me because of another client that one of my colleagues told me about. He shared a house with eight other people. Had they all contracted COVID? For him, the pain of COVID was something that brought up for him the torture that he experienced in his country of origin. He was contacted by multiple officials wanting to know, who were your contacts? Very much triggering the memories of interrogation that he had endured at the hands of the uh, of officials in his country. He felt he was being interrogated. 
he reacted in terror, butted his head. Police were called because it was a mental health crisis. He wanted the assistance of his counsellor, but this was not arranged for him. The police stayed outside and shouted at him because they were feared of, of COVID. He froze. Oxygen was provided and left outside his house. He didn't know how to use it. In order to access food and money, he had to answer multiple questions. So the whole experience was just aggravated for him by the way in which our services, and I'm not saying they were ill-intended at all, but they were certainly not well informed by the fact that many people have had traumatic histories, not only refugee people, even people without traumatic histories. The whole experience that they were going through was amplified in its uh, adverse effects. Next slide, please. Just another headline, just a couple of months old, recording that inequitable impact that, um, that Emiliano uh, captured so very well. And the headline reads, COVID death rate three times higher among migrants than those born in Australia. And the main group that affected there, people from the Middle East. Next slide, please. This is from an article from New South Wales from someone I know very well, uh, makes a similar point. We need to collect ethnicity data during COVID testing if we are to get on top of Sydney's outbreak. Just pointing to the importance and the lack of knowledge on the part of authorities and the community about who is being affected and why. And unless we have a deeper understanding of that, our capacity to provide effective responses is very hampered. This is a very key issue in the report of the Royal Commission into Mental Health Services in Victoria. We need to improve our data. We need to improve what is collected. We need to improve our understanding of what it means if we are to provide effective responses. It's true both in the mental health and in the physical health spaces. Next slide, please. If you read your age at the weekend, okay, first pages were all about the election. Granted, very important. Next page, the real front page. Headline, virus death hotspots in cities poorer suburbs. Again, identifying the need to understand the fact that there are inequitable impacts of COVID. And in that article, GPs are interviewed about trying to make sense of what are the factors at play here. One GP says, the reason for the high number of deaths was multi-pronged. Socioeconomic impacts could not be ignored the intersection with people's work, insecurity of work, poverty. He went on to say, social and cultural practices played a part in transmission and vaccination levels. Identifying his knowledge of the multiple factors at play. We can't simply take one slice and say, it's this, it's that. They do intersect. You've got large family gatherings where multiple large families come together on a regular basis, often culturally. Tying us back to that isolation factor, people cut off from friends, family, faith groups, trying to maintain their contact in order to maintain their well being. Okay, I've dealt at length with problems. So let me talk about some of the responses. I hope I'm going okay for time. I'll try and wrap this up in a few minutes. So 
as I said, governments were slow to respond, but when they responded, they provided the resources to ECCV, to us and to others. So for our part, we had a big focus on community consultations to get an understanding of what were the issues that people were seeing in their communities. And the groups that we focused on, Iraq, Syria, Chin, Karen, Assyrian, Chaldean, Sierra Leonean, South Sudan, Sri Lankan Tamil, Afghan, and Ethiopian. And we built, so we, that selection reflect, these are the main groups of refugee background, though certainly not all groups of refugee background. It reflected the strength of our staff from communities. And what were the things, yep, there's a comment there about mental health issues affecting people, for, absolutely. You cannot separate them, um, absolutely. Consultations identified groups as particularly vulnerable. And let me mention some of the key groups. Women. Women, especially when they were parents and carers, they had multiple responsibilities, lack of access to supports, also cut off. Young people. Young people arrived with hopes, expectations about building a new life. All of a sudden, they face these walls, these disappointments in their education, in their employment, in just their social connection with other young people. No, you can't go and mix with people, your peer groups. So their disappointment and anxiety is profound. And that's been true in the general population, but it affected people of a refugee background and certain migrant groups even more so, uh, precisely because of their aspirations coming from their backgrounds. School-aged children and young people dramatically affected by the closure of schools, unable to mix with their peers, required to learn at home in houses that lacked devices, in houses that were small, where you were competing for a space to study, where your parents were unable to provide the assistance to understand the information being given to them, parents who might not themselves have been literate. And for the elderly, going back to Samira, who I talked about at the beginning, often facing multiple disability issues, the physical as well as the mental, cut off from families experiencing grief. So what we did, we looked at counseling and group programs for individuals who are affected. Traditional work for us, but with a new lens of the impact of COVID and not being able to see clients face to face. Very difficult switching to telehealth for a lot of people, particularly for collect counseling. Engaging more staff from refugee backgrounds to work with communities. Supporting people in community to identify signs of mental illness, to reduce stigma and fear associated with mental health issues true across the community, but particularly true in certain communities. Working with community leaders, formal and informal, faith groups and other groups to develop strategies to support their vulnerable populations. So this is working with refugee communities and individuals. On the other side, working with the systems that were struggling with the overall population, but struggling in particular to recognize vulnerable groups and what adjustments they had to make. And here I'm talking about health services. I'm talking about schools. I'm also talking about police. Uh, understanding you've got groups of young people moving around. They're not able to go to school. They have to find things. How do you react to them? A common term that was used for me by 
my colleagues with whom I talked about in preparation for today was the issue of trust. You need to find ways of providing information and understanding through sources that the people affected trust. And that's not only a language issue, that's a knowledge issue. That's a cultural knowledge issue. What are the issues? What are the barriers to understanding? What are the other sources of information that people are getting about vaccinations, about the seriousness of the threats? If you so, so get an understanding that. of communities and the trust factors, you will make a big difference. And this is far from over. Governments have had to learn their lessons. If we are not safe in our different communities and groups, none of us are safe. Thank you. Sorry for going over. That's okay, Joffa. So what we're going to do, just so that we allow everybody gets to get uh, time to talk, we do have probably an opportunity for probably three questions. But if people have got questions, please put them in the chat. And what we could do as we go to the next presenter, that you can actually respond to the questions in the chat. Is everybody okay with that? I'm getting nods, no thumbs, but nods. Okay, so that's what we might do. So it makes it easier so that we keep on time. We're two minutes behind. So please put your question in the chat for your Jervis and Jervis can respond. So while people are doing that, I particularly would now like to introduce our second presenters. Liam, uh, most people would have been aware of the organisation, is a national non-for-profit organisation providing services to improve mental health and well-being in the local community. Liam has been over 31 years of experience in the community mental health sector. The co-presenters, I hope I said that right, I bet you are culturally diverse engagement workers in partnership with wellbeing programs within the organization. They both use collaborative uh, recovery approaches in their practice informed by current research. They both believe and value live experience and collaborative uh, practices. And before I hand it over to the both of them, I also want to mention that the compounding issues of intersectionality, different lengths, particularly LGBTIQA+, has been quite concerning in regards to some of the things that Joe has mentioned. Just want to put that in the space. So over to our next two presenters. Thank you. That's my great time. Just going to share the screen. Hope everyone can see this. Yeah. All right. Um, hey everyone, thank you um, for this time that we've been given to present at this forum, um, discussing mental health impacts of COVID-19 on people living with disability. Uh, my name is Betsy. I am a college engagement worker in Partners in Wellbeing Program within Lima and Nashville. Um, I'm presenting here with my co-worker, Pinar, who's also a college engagement worker. Uh, before I start, I want to uh, start with the acknowledgement of country. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians. Excuse me, I'm very sorry to interrupt. It's one of the sign language interpreters here. I've got the voice, um, the sound just cutting in and out a tiny bit. Has anyone else got that? Sorry, Betsy, to interrupt you. Just wanted to clarify it before you got going. No worries. I'm just going to speak like this. Hopefully that helps. No, thank you so much. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. I'm glad you pointed it out. Um, yeah, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of Kula Nation, and pay our respect to the elders past, present, and emerging. 
we recognize the important continuation of cultural, spiritual, and educational practice of a Torres Strait Islander and Aboriginal people. In particular, we recognize the resilience shown by the First Nation peoples in the face of genocide and ongoing oppression. Uh, before we get into the discussion, I wanted to provide an overview of what we'll be talking about today. I'm going to start with a short introduction about Partners in Wellbeing, as this is the program which was started because of response to COVID, uh, and then go into the mental health impact of COVID and called community and those living with disability. Um, we'll also discuss other supports available for those living with disability and also um, you know, finally opening the space up for any questions you might have. So Partisan Wellbeing is jointly funded by the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing and also Department of Jobs, Precedents and Regions. We are funded until the 30th of September this year. Um, Partisan Wellbeing supports people living in Victoria who've been impacted by COVID. And this is free and voluntary service for people um, 16 and over. Uh, those, um, you know, who might, people who can access this support do not need to be diagnosed with mental health conditions, um, and it could be their first time approaching a mental health service or first time even seeking help. Uh, we are open to them, and people are welcome to get the support in that space. Um, also, it's for people who are in care positions, so people who are caring for those who might be impacted by COVID people who own small business or are sole traders who identify as veteran or are from cult communities. We do not have any um, requirements in terms of visa. So anyone, um, even international students or people uh, seeking asylum can call in uh, this num the number that I'll be providing later and can get the support from Partisan Wellbeing. Uh, Partisan Wellbeing is designed so that it does not replicate other services and that may already be available. So ideally case management and NDIS participants are able to access this support through their current support. Um, and also uh, people who might be connected with uh, primary health network funded programs as well, like psychosocial support. Um, and if the person has disengaged from the other funding and would like to connect, we are able to provide that linkage. Um, just quickly going over the support that we provide. Um, these are the three components that are there. Uh, we provide one-on-one -on -one phone support with the same worker from the start to the end. And um, it could be short to medium term support, which can look like successions. Um, we provide well-being support, financial counseling, and business advice. Um, I'm going to also talk about the, our workforce. So we have um, you know, staff from different uh, experiences. So people who have experienced mental health support worker from range of uh, experience in the field, that is social work, nursing, OT background. We have lived experience workers, uh, people who are bilingual. Um, also interpreters are available for those who need it. Um, and important thing to notice that staff are not counselors or crisis support workers. Um, you know, we, if the person like to link to a qualified counselor or a psychologist, we are able to provide that support. Um, partisan well-being is delivered by three uh, services, that is NIMAI uh, service providers, that is NIMAI, each and EXO. Um, and, you know, we are available um, Monday to Friday, 9 to 10 and 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekends. This is also to uh, support people who might not be able to call during the business hours. And we connect uh, to the appropriate service depending on where you reside. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Pinar and I both are called uh, engagement workers. So I wanted to speak a bit about this space and also kind of address this to what uh, Joseph has spoken before in terms of the need that is there to um, support people in the cult communities um, during COVID, especially during COVID, as that's the service that we provide. Um, you know, as you're aware, um, we are actively committed to delivering culturally responsive and culturally safe program. As a result, we have created a cult advisory group, which consists of eight bicultural leaders from various backgrounds, including business owners and community members. 
Um, this is so that we can have inputs and conversations from them so that we are able to um, improve our engagement and to provide, also get better understanding of what the, the needs in the community are. Uh, we often have pop-up information stalls across Victoria. Um, we frequent places such as places of worship, market and multicultural events, festivals and shopping centers. Um, we, have have, we have attended over uh, 65 events and have created partnership with uh, 390 plus uh, community organization across Victoria um, and to, uh, to continue to promote partisan well-being and make effort to maintain a presence in the community. Um, and we actively engage with transcultural and ethno-specific organizations, uh, community leaders, faith-based leaders, um, trying to work closely with them to address the barriers that cult communities have, um, you know, especially them, what they face accessing mental health services and also navigating these services. Um, I'm gonna dive into the mental health impacts of COVID on cult communities. Uh, but before I get into that, just wanted to provide a bit of a definition around mental health um, and also psychosocial disability. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's start with talking about mental health. Mental health is defined as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes their own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make contribution to their community. This um, definition is created by the World Health Organization in 2010. And as you see, it encompasses many aspects of a person's life, but this may not ring true to you. So I encourage you to think about your own definition of mental health using the language that you're comfortable with. Uh, for some people, it could be mental health uh, has nothing to do with work. For some, it could be a big part of their identity. Um, Moving to psychosocial disability, uh, it refers to social um, consequences of disability and the way that your life is impacted by mental health. Uh, people uh, affected by uh, psychosocial disability may find it challenging to set goals, have plans and engage in education, training and employment or other social and cultural activities. Um, and these are um, yeah, these are some of the things that people face with psychosocial disability, as I said. I'm um, going to pass on to Pinar to dive into the subject even further. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Betsy. So we're going to discuss the mental health impacts of COVID on cold community. So I'll get Betsy to just change the slide for me, please. Um, so what we know is that, you know, COVID has impacted everyone in the community and there's an additional layer as we've mentioned previously, thanks Joseph, um, of impact from those particularly from cold backgrounds as they've been disproportionately affected. Some of the, um, I guess, uh, themes that are present when we've been engaging with people from cold backgrounds is that there's been an um, exacerbation of the fear and uncertainty created by COVID um, and how that sort of triggers memories of traumatic experiences for people particularly from refugee backgrounds. Um, we know that, you know, increased stress and pressure um, across generations due to concerns about family living overseas and that isolation that's present there is also another impact. Um, we've also got um, not being able to access accurate information about COVID and the fast changing rules due to maybe um, lack of in-language resources, um, the public fear of COVID and how it can manifest as discrimination, stigmatization, um, and essentially a scapegoating of some cult communities um, and, you know, we've seen that there's a lot of stigma and shame connected to having mental health issues, particularly in cult communities. Um, and again, you know, the feelings of isolation and not knowing really where to access these services regarding mental health. Um, and, you know, what we found is that, you know, cult communities constantly echo that there's a lack of engagement with mental health support services because there's a lack of trust. Um, which obviously leads some individuals within those cold communities to feel extremely neglected and abandoned by systems. So moving on to the next slide. Um, we know that our society is filled with inaccessible spaces for people living with disabilities, um, as well as you know, negative attitudes around disability exist in Australia today. Um, in Australia, people with disabilities experience several disadvantages, like a lower likelihood of achieving higher education, um, and a high chance of being, you know, outside the workforce. 
Um, that doesn't ring true for everybody with, you know, that's the thing with a disability, but we know that mental health conditions can um, be both a cause and an effect of disability and often involve activity limitations and participation restrictions beyond the core areas of communication, um, like mobility, self-care, and even in their personal relationships. So as you can see, we've got some four key themes here. Um, the first being your health is complicated and interrelated. You know, physical symptoms of your disability can affect your motivation, mood, or whether you take part in social or spiritual activities. For instance, you know, chronic pain may mean you stay at home more due to worrying about pain flaring up. And as we know, that's been exacerbated by COVID, not having that ability. Um, we've got using support and health systems can be difficult or even traumatic for people with disabilities. So um, we know that some people live with invisible symptoms and at times they can be dismissed or not believed by professionals and this can be super daunting and leave people feeling helpless and lost. We also know that past challenging experiences relating to disability may also affect daily life. Um, this may include how you acquired your disability, childhood health treatment, bullying, discrimination or even exclusion. Um, for instance, past trauma can impact how you feel about going to a, a doctor or how you feel about yourself, um, you know, in light of being with other people. Um, and we've also got people with disabilities often have, you know, an additional daily living cost and lower incomes than people without disabilities. So socioeconomic status is really important and this can be due to the cost of long-term health care um, and discrimination around employment that exists. So we know that financial uncertainty and stress can certainly impact your mental health. Um, we'll move on to the particular mental health impacts due to the pandemic and, um, you know, people with disabilities have been overlooked and particularly those with disabilities coming from cold backgrounds have been disproportionately affected. Um, some of these impacts include, you know, ongoing safety concerns as a result of isolation, as well as individuals' fear of safety concerns um, has only been exacerbated throughout the pandemic. Um, Pre-existing feelings of loneliness have increased um, and those symptoms of anxiety and depressive symptoms whilst being in lockdown um, and the failure to ensure safety of people with disabilities in congregate living or health facilities and access to those, um, as well as access for people with disabilities to food deliveries, internet, COVID testing, um, water sanitation, hygiene facilities, um, as well as you know, the failure to give relevant people with disabilities or their families the support workers, their carers, um, evidence-based priority for um, vaccinations and treatment where required. Um, in terms of the challenges that mental health services have faced in trying to support those with disabilities, I guess one of the most important things is significant wait lists um, for people wanting to access supports to engage with the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, for example, NEMI's um, NDIS Access Project currently has around 80 people waiting for support, um, psychosocial focused, but prior to COVID, there was no wait list. Um, so that shows the increased need for supports in the disability space. And we know that COVID continues to highlight the underlying inequities, the discrimination and exclusion that people with disability experience in the delivery of fundamental services and supports. Um, the overall deprioritization of people with disability and a lack of understanding for their health and well-being, indicating a lack of systemic preparedness and service coordination. Um, and that was said to be one of the leading causes in the Royal Commission into Mental Health, um, although the government's you know, claim to um, work towards creating different systems. So that, that's overcome. And again, unclear public health messaging or lack of accessible messaging based on maybe, you know, um, English not being first language for certain people may not have access to those services as well as failure to collect data, as Joseph mentioned. You know, there's not enough data, um, which will allow for disaggregation. Um, what we'll do is we'll move on to sort of the other supports um, that are available for those living with disability. As my colleague Betsy mentioned, Partners in Wellbeing is free for all Victorians. It's a confidential service. You don't need to have a pre-existing mental health condition to access it. You don't need to disclose your disability. It's free and available. There's no visa or Medicare requirements. Um, but, you know, the only exclusion criteria for that is if, you know, an individual is um, linked in with NDIS, they may not be able to access. Um, but we do have the Mental Health and Wellbeing Hub, who what's sort of available to all Victorians of all ages um, who have symptoms of mental ill health. Um, you know, um, the age is 16 and over, 
And if they are under 16, then a parental guardian consent is required. Um, so the good thing about this program is you can access all those support services that Betsy mentioned earlier um, while being on NGIS. So there are some eligibility exclusions um, that we can get into, and that's just not mirroring the wellbeing support that the Partners in Wellbeing offers, as well as the mental health. Um, essentially, you know, your core partners in wellbeing to book an in-person appointment or even a telehealth. And we also have some pop-up clinics um, um, that are sort of all around Victoria. And um, you can go onto the coronavirus.vic.gov.au forward slash mental health hub to find your nearest help. We've also got um, sort of, so the National Disability Insurance Scheme is a new way of providing support to people with disability, including people with severe mental illness. And NDIS supports can help with doing everyday activities and connecting individuals with the community. Um, the Mental Health Community Support Services Intake Service in NEMI are assisting all Victorians um, to access this. And we work collaboratively with other services to help people understand, engage, and complete the NDIS access process. Um, so what the service can do essentially is assist you to gather supporting evidence and complete the access request form, liaise with relevant health services and general practitioners, private psychiatrists, act as a contact person for NGIS inquiries at your request, um, collect and collate additional evidence if required by NGIS to ensure the timely completion of the access process, as well as follow up with NGIS on the status of application. And in the event, you know, you need a review of your application, this team will help you in appealing that decision. Um, and this is just a little map of the um, intake assessment service. Um, so there's different numbers for each catchment that you live, just like partners in wellbeing, depending on where you reside, you'll be connected to the appropriate supports. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us and we'll open up um, for some questions on the chat, then we'll be happy to reply. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that great presentation. And um, I also, particularly before we go to questions, because there are one, particularly in the chat, I do want to say, um, as a follow on from the opening comment I made, was that I reported to the Victorian government last year the amount of people, particularly from culturally diverse communities, who are part of the LGBTIQA community. Uh, I actually had to go back into their closet during COVID and lockdown. And, and that actually was compounded by other issues. But, you know, that whole thing, when you start looking at intersectional lens, it does have a major impact. Um, so the question we've got, if a person with a disability has contracted COVID and lives by themselves and needs to isolate, how long does it take before Auslan provides, provides the support in terms of dealing with the impact of COVID? In my experience, it takes three days. Margarita, that... can I just interrupt? It's not Auslan, it's Nimai. So just to clarify, I made a mistake there. Sorry, it's Auslan's. Oh, sorry, it's uh, Nimai Services. Okay, so it doesn't take three days. Thank you. All right, so in that case, we will now open it to the forum. Now, because I can't see everyone, does everybody know how to use your hand up um, function in Zoom? Or just put your question or comments in the chat? Because we've got three slides of people. So I'm not going to be able to see everyone. And this will make it easier for me to facilitate. Now we do have five minutes for questions. So if I just go to the next screen. Uh, moving between screens. Nobody's got any, oh yes, okay, good. Over to you. Thank you. So my, my question is directed to Nimai. I know from my experiences, given that I contracted COVID at the beginning of the year, it took them three days before someone from a, for example, from a DLO, DLO service, before they even contacted me, living by myself. Does Nimai provide 
a much quicker response to people dealing with mental health issues and further other supports and looking to other further supports. Or is this still a three day process before they make contact? No, um, Nemo will get back to you, particularly partners in wellbeing. We've got a 24 hour turnaround, even quicker than that. So we, we do our best. We understand it is a COVID response program. So we really work towards ensuring that we get back to everybody in a timely manner. And that could be, you know, 24 hours. If it's, as Betsy mentioned, there's a specific period in which you can call. If you call, I don't know, let's say at 6 p.m. on a weekday, on a weekend, then that will go straight to the voicemail and the next intake worker who is present will um, endeavour to get back to you as soon as they can. Thank you very much. Um, I, I am aware that there will be some questions that will be taken on notice. And so thank you for that response. Any other questions? I'm trying to look at the chat. Um, so just be aware that we are posting names of organizations. If anybody is feeling triggered, uh, those organizations are being listed in the chat. Nobody putting questions in, so I just assume that nobody wants to say anything. Okay. So, oh, hang on. So, could we have those presentations in writing? So, the two uh, presenters, will you be releasing your presentation for this network? Yeah, we Send them through to Surmele, um, so um, we can we can reshare them with anybody with our contact details. And if anybody wants to have a chat about how they can get involved and how we can engage, we're more than happy to have those conversations. Lovely. Okay, so what we're going to do is because we've got three screens of people, we're going to take photos of each of them if that's okay, and then we're going to go for a break a little bit early so that we actually have more than five minutes for a break. So you can stretch your legs, take a walk, a quick walk around your house or wherever you are, and then come back for the experience. So cameras off if you do not want your photo taken, cameras on if you'd like to be part of a group photo. This should only take about 30 seconds to do photos of each screen. Are we all okay? ECCV, you're ready to take the photos. Okay, so smile, everyone. I think that's it. All done. Okay. Yeah. So, folks, please go on and have a stretch, coffee break. We'll see you back at 11.35. Thank you.
Are we all back? I think we're all back. Uh, the interpreter's back. And I think we've got an interpreter back. Okay. Is everybody else? Looks like everybody's going for a walk around the block. Okay. So what I might do, because I can't see the next presenter, our question is not back in the room. It is, yeah, good. And it's the interpreters back in the room. Okay. Thank you. All right, so let's get back into the second half of today's forum. First of all, I wanted to acknowledge the previous presenters. Um, it was it was fabulous to get an update from two very different organisations in regard to the work that's been happening. So this um, half of the session, we're actually going to hear, hear from live experiences. But before I do, I want to introduce you to Christian. Most people would know, but if you don't, uh, Christian is the Program Manager of D Diversity and Disability Program at the Migrant Resource Centre in Northwest in St Albans where he's been supporting culturally diverse people with disabilities to be more independent in their lives and speak up for themselves for more than 15 years. He fluently speaks four languages and sits on a number of boards and committees in the community and the disability sector, including the Victoria and Disability Workers Registration Board, the Victoria and Disability Service Board, and the Victorian Disability Community Council for NDIS. Uh, Christian Over will talk about the impact on people's mental health uh, to go out, be involved. So over to you, Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Margarita, for the uh, presentation. I would like to uh, acknowledge the uh, traditional uh, own it of uh, uh, the line we are sitting on and pay my respect with the elders, the past, present, and emerging. Okay, <laughs> now with my uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I will be uh, talking about some of the uh, impact of uh, uh, COVID within uh, uh, the community and specifically in regard to all uh, people with uh, the government. Now, I would like to start by saying that there is no doubt that, generally speaking, people with a disability are very much resilient. And that some people have been in lockdown for most of their lives because of the barriers that there are in society still now. But we also need to consider that after two years of lockdown, some people with a disability have been severely uh, affected. And uh, I find it very difficult to get back to a normal life, well, to get back to normal in the everyday life. Mental health issues 
have access to free food. Uh, uh, with the uh, following sim symptoms. Depression, not willing to go out of home, not wanting to have any physical contact with people, and, and still being scared of casting COVID. P people also who have refused or delayed vaccination against a COVID, uh, are the ones who have even more difficulty to get back to normal life because they are the ones who have been in isolation for a longer period of time. Can we move to the next slide, please? The, the pandemic has created many challenges. Also, for people with a disability who require support in their everyday life, can it work and it's still now difficult to find enough support work. The pandemic has created a situation where support workers do not feel comfortable to work with new clients. It is also the case that some people with a disability do not feel comfortable to work with new support workers. This has also mean that there is less availability of support workers. And this feedback that we have received directly from both support worker and client. The other issue has been about isolation being very dangerous because it can create situations uh, of people with a disability relying on very few or even only one person who support them in their everyday lives. This is to can create situations of abuse and neglect for people with a disability. And this is where I always say we need to uh, have, avoid the situation where there is only one working or very few people to support the person with a disability. Also, the availability of a support worker has gone down uh, for a number of reasons, including the, the fact that they don't want to work in the disability sector uh, uh, anymore. And they are also uh, the one that didn't want to get vaccinated. Uh, uh, and based on uh, a bit of a survey that we have done within our uh, diversity and disability program, uh, I would say about 10% uh, uh, of support workers are not coming. Uh, back 
go war in the disability system. And also, COVID-19 has uh, just separation as equation that is already very critical in the disability sector, particularly with a support worker being employed on a casual basis, not getting enough hour with one provider and some working for different providers at the same time. And of course, like in the case of age care facility, workers who work for different providers are more at risk of getting both infected and transmitting COVID-19 to other people. Now, um, the other important thing that currently the government and union are working together on a solution to create a more sustainable disability workforce in terms of support work by requesting a minimum of two hours to be paid for every shift. If approved, this new measure will be implemented from the 3rd of July 2022. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, now, here I provide a few uh, recommendations on how to move uh, forward. Provide more support to people with a disability who are dealing with mental health issues, but do not recognize the issue within themselves. Provide more awareness and information on mental health for the whole community because obviously we need to remove any kind of stigma and shame that is uh, associated with mental health. Make disability a priority in future pandemic by providing accessibility to information, support, and vaccination from the start, which is something we didn't see happening in this <laughs> A pandemic. Provide more funding to people with a disability to support a plan to better pay the workers and still retain the flexibility that a participant wants. And it is more related about the new um, measure because if we are going to pay our support worker for a minimum of two hours, then that means that we need more funding to be able to pay for that. And also provide more information and access to a technology and communication devices for people with a disability 
to overcome isolation. Now, this is another very big one because we found with our program that when we move our four groups to an online platform, not everyone was able to join our group because they could not use the technology or they didn't have the right technology and devices to be able to connect online. And also, I think when people with a disability who are NDIS participants can appreciate COVID rapid care and PPE on, on their plan without going through a review of their plan. Because as we all know, a plan review with the NDIS can take a long time. And sometimes, when we go out for a review of the plan, you can get some more money for certain things, and then you lose other money for other things. And also, uh, create new employment opportunities for people with a disability based on the flexibility that has been created because of the pandemic in regard to working from home. So that can be a, another opportunity for employment and education for people with a disability. But I would like to make it clear that it shouldn't be the only opportunity. It's all about flexibility in the workplace and in education. Now, in this last slide, I provide my contact this time. So you are welcome to contact me. And if you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you. Okay, so... And... Because we've got two more questions. Now, Maru is a young woman from the western suburbs of Melbourne. Maru, I hope I'm saying it right, was born in South Sudan, moved to Egypt with her family when she was two years old, then came to live in Tasmania, though only there for less than a year before moving to Melbourne when she was 12 years old. No one in her family knew English when they arrived in Australia. She went to a language school for about a year when she arrived in Melbourne and then into high school to the end of year 12. She has agreed to share her thoughts, uh, experience relating to mental health issues, particularly those arising during the COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you, but thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Hey. Um, my name is Nyaru. I'm a bit nervous. I currently live in Melbourne, uh, the western suburb of Melbourne. I acquired my disability due to an accident in 2008. After my accident, I was in hospital for about three months, and then I was moved to rehabilitation hospital for about 10 months. 
after I left the rehab, I went to Paraquad. I don't know if you guys heard of Paraquad. Um, it's um, like a halfway house. Um, what it's owned by Independent Australia for about two years. When I finally uh, left there, I had been living there, living away from home um, for a bit more than three years. I have battled with anxiety and depression for many years. Things I had no experience of prior to the accident. I had a lot of pain, both mental and physical. And I was really self medicating with alcohol to numb the pain. I was diagnosed as an alcoholic about two years after I started drinking happily. I would start drinking early in the, in the afternoon, right up until bedtime. Sorry guys, this is a bit personal, so that's why I'm a bit nervous. Um, about 10 to 11 p.m. I was drinking wherever I could, and sometimes I left the house to drink with my friends. My family and my carers had no idea where I was. It was a dangerous place. During this time, I did try to study, but failed. With the help of my psychologist, I was able to stop drinking in 2016. The psychologist also helped me identify things I really wanted to do, which was study. Um, starting my studies coincided with the start of the pandemic. Coincided, sorry, coincided um, with the pandemic. The, the study um, commitment really helped me overcome depression and anxiety. Um, the information I had at the start of pandemic certainly contributed to my anxiety increasing again. The news about how the virus was transmitted was, was scary. I heard that the virus could be passed on through healthcare workers. So I was very worried about, about not being able to have my carers or possibly getting the virus from, from them. Some of my carers also worked in aged care and they weren't allowed to work in both setting. So I lost them. The first lockdown was hard, hard, but I had a lot of, I had a wound at the, at the time and it wasn't really going, going out of the house much anyways. However, by the third lockdown, I was becoming angry and frustrated and bored of having even small things. Um, I can, I can usually do, I can usually do take a, a, um, taken away from me, just a small outings like going around the block, going to the park, seeing my neighbors and having coffee at a cafe didn't happen. Everyone was locked inside and scared to go out. I did take it out of my family. Being able to study again has been the most wonderful thing for me and my mental health. But the study only became possible because of the help of my psychologist. And psych, the psych found an educational psychologist and that person found the right university to, for me and my needs. And also found the tutor I can work with online. The first course I did led me into a diploma I'm doing now, but it didn't, but if I had, a, I had, I had found the right support and at the start, I wouldn't be where I am now. Working with a psychologist over Zoom meeting has helped a lot of my mental health and well being. I would always say that if you feel you need help or there are changes in your mood or your, your lifestyle, seek help for 
from someone who can teach teach you how to best handle and manage it. With the right support for your mental health, you really know, you really don't know where where it might take you. Qualification, employment, confident, and it isn't just you who will benefit your friends, family, and workmates and the community at all, all gets something. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I was a bit nervous. Uh, I'm waving um, in Auslan. I'm clapping, actually, just so you know what I'm doing. Uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, your powerful presentation. And um, yes, you didn't come across nervous. You spoke beautifully. That's so I, I want to say thank you from everybody in, in this Zoom meeting. One final person to present today is, I'm not doing good on names, so please excuse me once again. Yunika uh, Yuni, born into a zero of chronic health conditions. They were given a 0% chance of making it past his second birthday. He was born with less than 50% of his lungs, functioning and mental issues that prevented him from having the ability to eat. Living in hospital can have dramatic uh, impact on your mental health, but he found a way to overflow with positivity and cheerfulness, adopting the hospital staff surrounding him as a surrogate family. He has found independence and a way to strive while still being supported through his mental health challenges, chronic illness and disability. In 2021, after highlighting to the Royal Commission's concerns around the vaccination rollout, amongst those with disabilities. He started working with Victorian government, helping spread awareness and assessing concerns as a COVID-19 vaccination community champion. Over to you, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I would like to start by um, acknowledging the powerful story from before. And I would say that um, mental health is ongoing and baby steps and good on you. I was nervous when I first started presenting, um, but baby steps. I know that COVID-19 can be a uh, overwhelming and very fearful thing, but own, you own where you are, own where you've come from, and that's to everyone, um, and just baby steps, because I have to deal with it as well. Um, I'm a 26-year-old. Um, I feel very, like, underrated compared to everything else. It's been so... There's so much to go over in my mind. Um, I'm a 26 year old that has done work for the NDS. I've done work for the Victorian government. I've um, been a part of service providers. Um, and I think the moral of the story is um, you can achieve anything if you've got the right support. Um, and um, I did a, I filmed a, hour and a half documentary over five years about my life. That was very daunting. Um, it got so stressful to the point where I'm just like, I don't care if people like it. It's it's my story. It, it's hopefully I can educate people and help people. Um, but I think uh, I saw an article yesterday from a very well-known service provider in Australia. And um, one, of, uh, one sentence out of a very long paragraph was, um, we can hold politicians to account. And my first response is, okay, politicians make the framework, but service providers need to implement it. And um, organizations in general need to listen to people with a disability and mental health. Um, so we need to be held accountable to tell our own story if we choose to. Um, because there's only going to get real change if it's practical change. Um, and the, um, the, 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 the Flemington Towers 
um, situation um, highlights to me, unfortunately, it probably needed to be done for the safety of themselves and everyone else. I understand that. But um, with my mental health, when I went through COVID, I already felt locked in a cage, in a box. I don't want to be so old fashioned using those words, but I felt isolated already. Um, so I could only imagine what it's, and I've got immense support already. Um, I could only imagine what it's like to be, I don't know, alone and not understanding something. Um, I speak English, but, uh, you know, culturally diverse people may not understand something, but I think I can relate that to me not understanding something at, at times because I don't understand information given to me sometimes unless it's in a particular matter. Um, so uh, I think when Emilio was talking as well, intersectionality, I think... Uh, Australia and the government kind of, and NDIS as well, kind of just throws it all together and you, they make their own assumptions. I, th I think it's important to uh, treat everything individually. So like treat the disability and assess that individually and how someone feels about that. Then take the, dis take the mental health and then join it together, not just assume that they're together. Um, I, for the first 15 or 16 years of my life, got told that, of course, I have a disability. Of course, I have mental health. Sorry, I have a disability. I'm like, well, that doesn't really help, does it? Um, because I acted out in school. I was um, uh, the typical statistic youth wanting to be a gangster, wanting to get into trouble, not caring about the world, was in foster care for most of my life, um, came from group homes. Um, so uh, there's so much I can say, but the, the reason why I'm here is to talk about the impacts of what it was like being in COVID. Um, I was in a group home uh, late last year um, and I was in a unit with one other person with an intellectual disability. Um, and the guys in their main house were six people that were nonverbal with autism and they all got COVID. Their staff got COVID. I did not somehow, don't know how, I, 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 I don't know. Um, I have a lung condition, so you could only imagine what that would be like if I was to get COVID. Um, I say that I would most likely die. Um, I don't know if that's the case, I would assume so. My immune system's quite crap already. Um, and I had, I had the same pressures as, you know, the last presenter, not being able to go out, not being able to get my own meds, not being able to go to see friends. I went to an NDIS rally last Thursday. I was petrified. I went there and met, um, you know, my lawyer from the disability rights law firm and Bill Shorten and, you know, supported my people. But I was still scared. Um, I was still very nervous. Um, and I've had my three vaccines. <sighs> think the biggest piece I can take away from this and my brain is just like overwhelmed because it was there was such good presentations today and I could pick on everything um, is it's okay it's okay to have a disability it's okay to have mental health and you don't need to shy away from it and it's really disappointing that the LGBTQI people had to go back into the closet um it's just like I, I i don't i don't care what you believe in like if we get along we get along like it shouldn't be about what we look like who we like who we don't like what we do what we don't do um and really focus this is what i'm doing at the moment in my own personal life with my support workers is really focusing on what you want to do in life and what you want to what you want to achieve and success i learned uh very abruptly because i thought i had to be wealthy and rich and whatever success is what you make it success is what you want it to be um and once you know what you want to do drive to do that um because i know it can be 
it can be crippling. Um, it's to, uh, the, the simple facts are that it's an invisible thing that can kill you, which is terrifying. Um, and I could only imagine, um, I've had some operations where I've not been able to speak after waking up for, you know, medical reasons. And it's scary not being able to communicate. And I would only imagine if you were, if you couldn't speak English, what that would be like. Um, but I think we're, we're transitioning from institutional days into us becoming more accepted. I think it's um, service providers, governments need to um, get rid of agendas, get rid of a desired goal or a desired response and just listen to what we have to say. Um, I'm not saying that those agendas are good or bad. I'm just saying people coming with preconceived notions and stuff. It's just like, have a conversation with us, chat to us. Um, like I may not have the answers, but I have insight. I'm not saying, and I think with people with mental health in this forum is own it. It's all right. It's cool. Sweet. Just own it. And you have the right to speak up and. Yes, it's highly, highly difficult to keep motivated. Um, but if you need people around you to support you, that's not that's not a shame. That's not that's not you know that's not um, it's not something to be ashamed of or disappointed. Um, I was listening to um, Nim's presentation, and I'm just like that was that's the most easy English, basic, down to earth, chilled presentation I've ever I've I've seen in a long time. It was it was great that there's things out there, um, but yeah, I I and I think also, and this is something that I'm learning currently. It's okay to get diagnosed. It's okay to actually own it, because um, I I, I self-destruct in relationships. I don't. I self-destruct with my support workers. I self-destruct with myself, I crack the shits all the time. Um, but it's kind of like, oh yeah, you've got these traits, you got this, you might have this, you might not have that. I'm just like, I just want to know so I can get the support for it. Um, and I, 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 the saddest thing I learned is governments needed to respond and do what they had to do to keep everyone safe, but they forgot to remember how we may or may not feel. Um, I sit here and I live in Victoria and um, I reflect on people saying what the Victorian government did. And it's very conflicting because in my mind, they did the right thing, but they didn't implement it in the right way. They didn't, uh, yeah, um, and I, Unfortunately, there's no there's no one rule or one answer to mental health in general. So when we tell people how we feel, we mm, there's no evidence for it. So how do you feel like that? Okay, if you feel like that, what do you want us to do? Well, I don't know. It's, it's not it's not a straight answer. It's how we feel. Um, there's no answer to this, and it was. I don't know. Um, I will. I became. I was meant to meet up with a friend recently, and um, I didn't want to because my phone was dying. So I went home, and that person went back to Queensland, and I found out a few hours later that they had COVID. And I'm like, okay, I, I thought I could go out. Um, but yeah, I don't know what else to add. I, I feel like I'm going around in circles. It's just there's so much floating around in my brain, and um, but I've had, yeah, I've had experience with mental health. I've consulted with governments. I've, um, I'm a normal person. I have my bad days. I have, um, I have up to 40 hours a week of three, four different support workers. Um, I have a, I call them an entourage because if I didn't have my people, I, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. Um, and I just want to remind people with, people with disability, I might be on this side of the table, um, but I'm a normal person. I, I struggle. I, I have difficulties. Um, I have bad days. Um, but that's me. 
that I, I, if you have any questions, I will, um, I'm looking at the chat and there's a lot of allies here. So obviously I may have done something right. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. I hope, um, yeah, I, 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 I kind of feel like having nothing to add is good because that means everyone else did a great job, which means we're all getting somewhere together progressively. Um, yeah, thanks for your time, guys. I, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank oh, you, well, there's, there's, there is one question. Hi, Oli, can you talk about the impact on your biological parents? Um, hesitance to vaccine. Um, yeah, um, just very quickly, my biological parents are Turkish and, um, my father was a bricklayer for many, many years and um, passed away in the Royal Melbourne Hospital from um, COVID-19 complications. Now, um, I wasn't close with my father. My father was very uh, culturally um, determined and culturally stubborn. Um, and I grew up in a Maltese family, so very different. Um, my Maltese mother um, always uh, made sure that I was Australian and that's it. I wear a cross, but that's my own choice. Um, but was always very open-ended, very, I, I look after you, I love you, but you know, you do have parents. And my dad didn't want to get vaccinated, um, didn't believe in it. Um, and I respect people's, I respect people's beliefs and what they believe in and what they want to do and what the, they don't want to do. And I say this to all media outlets, I will lead the horse to water. I will not make them drink. I'm not going to fight with people that are anti-vaxxers. I'm not going to, you believe what you want to believe. I'm happy to have a productive conversation. I'm not going to disrespect your values and you don't disrespect mine. That's just. I just can't be bothered arguing. Um, but my 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 dad, I saw him in intensive care. Um, he was a stocky, wide-shouldered brick, bricklayer, big solid dude. Um, lost all his belly fat, uh, was yellow, and um, had a tube in his throat. And that ironically, that tube kept me alive for about the first six years, seven years of my life. Um, obviously, back then, he didn't want me to have that tube. Um, I get tube fed even to this day. And he had, he was getting, you know, intravenously fed. Um, I wanted to be angry with him. I wanted to be upset with him. Um, and this goes back to my, this goes back to, probably goes back to mental health and trauma. Um, but when I saw him with those things, I had no reason to be angry with him. He was defenseless. He was, um, he made, he, he made his choice. And unfortunately you can't fabricate a medical condition. You can't fabricate medical facts. It is what it is. Um, and I, my social workers and psychologists turn around and said, we're not going to tell you what to do, but I don't, we don't want you to live with the what ifs. The what if you didn't go? I'd rather you be angry at him than not go and then be just angry at yourself for the rest of your life. Um, I decided to write the last chapter of that book. I forgave him. I will never forgive him, but I forgave him. At the end of the day, he's my father. Um, and what sort of person am I to not give someone the benefit of the doubt in their final moments of life. Um, and I think, I don't know. I don't know what message to take out of that. Um, I, I don't, I try and be very tactful and very ginger about it because some people say, yeah, he's your father. Why aren't you all more emotional? Um, my dad gave me stubbornness. My dad gave me determination. That's about it. I unfold, I, I'm complete transparency. I have borderline personality disorder. 
Um, and one of my biggest issues is abandonment. And that's probably because of my parents, not their fault, definitely not their fault, but I think it just highlights the cultural divide that, um, the cultural difficulty, sorry, there's not a, really a cultural divide or there might be cultural difficulty in Australia because my mum was slightly intellectually challenged and my dad didn't think it was his job. Um, and unfortunately, we had Turkish interpreters when I was born back in the 90s um, to try and train my mum and they just couldn't do it. So I think maybe in that sense, it might highlight if, you know, parents had the right support um, to get into systems and to get integrated. Um, definitely, I agree, once you're in the system, um, it takes a lot, a lot more fighting to get what you need. But I think getting into the system um, is really, really, um, difficult. And just quickly on a side note, one of my, um, one of my friends that's, uh, 32 didn't really have, um, a job or an education, had a disability, um, passed away two days ago, not from COVID, just passed away. But the highlight to that is, um, because he didn't get the support, he ended up in an aged care home. Um, and because he couldn't justify, you know, all the complexities of his dis disability, his NDIS package was so slim. So I think it's just a highlight that um, being stigmatized or having, not stigmatized, but having a disability or mental health puts you at a disadvantage in society in general, which is not okay. Um, yeah. Um, any questions? I, yeah. Sorry for the tangent, but I tried to uh, I tried to point out the takeaways from my presentation, and I think those are the two. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and Oslan saying thank you for a most wonderful and powerful presentation and insight. We're almost to the end of today's. We've only got really five minutes left. But what I want to do uh, is emphasize one thing and then open up if people would like to make closing comments, what they've got out of today, or any questions you would have from the people who have just spoken. I want to emphasize that barriers worsened for PR culturally diverse people with disabilities by COVID 19. It is so urgent that people with disabilities must be considered in a climate disaster or pandemic planning. We have been left behind again and again and again. Nothing without us without us. I'm going to now open it. If people would like to make some comments of what you've got out today, or if you've got questions you'd like to ask, we've got five minutes so that allows the people who would like to start. If any of the presenters would like to ask me anything or vice versa, so we can, you know, engage in conversation if I've missed anything. There was a lot. There was a lot of good stuff. Or anyone at all. Silly. I don't mind. Silly questions, Hi. simple questions. Margarita, can I just ask nearly a question? Uh, somebody's asking a question. I can't see you. I don't know. Yep, Sirmeli. Sirmeli. Yes, so yes. it's really from Mr. CV. Well, thank you to both Narab and Yuli. <clears throat> that was really powerful. And, you know, it takes a lot of effort to share your personal um, story. I, I thank you, both of you. Now, I know that when you, Yuli, you and I spoke over the phone, um, we spoke for a little while, and, uh, and you, you spoke about some of the impacts of COVID on your mental health. Yep. And in particular, you spoke about the, um, you know, the frustration you had, which you touched on, um, with your biological parents, yep. um, and and how that affected your mental health. Um, so I think I think that's sort of um, a lot of cold, you know, cold communities um, who have, you know, who might have someone, that, you know, in the family who has a disability. Um, there's that sense of, um, 
you know, taking the control out of, away from the person with the disability and and uh, and feeling like it's the person without the disability, it's their responsibility to make the decision. Yeah. Um, and I think I think through our conversation, what we 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 spoke a little bit about that, and you touched uh, a little bit about that. Yeah. Um... Yeah, if yeah. You, if, you, if you would no, like no, to share, I, I, but I, I, I sit here and ponder because um, I know someone from the office of the public advocate that is uh, trying to navigate with the office and the legal team about how people with disability accessing the vaccine when their guardians, parents, or someone else might not want to have their child have the vaccine um uh, i'm probably a bit biased but whether you're non-verbal got schizophrenia you know just come out of a you know psych ward or just come out of hospital if if you have an independent third party with the experiences to um you know help you make that decision i you, you should be able to make that decision yourself and I'm, I know this might be a bit controversial, but I spent most of my life in hospital so, and disability. So dignity over risk is a big thing for me. Like if you don't want it, I'm, I'm going to respect you. Like it doesn't um, make a change. It's a big issue. I don't, I don't, I don't think that people um, should have their control taken away from them. Um, where, whether you need support or not. Um, for example, I was under a guardianship and I brought my movie out and um, because I filmed the experience of getting off a guardianship order, apparently I wasn't able to um, speak about that. And my point in the conversation is um, what I'm learning around my mentors is if you have an advocate or you have someone supporting you, you know, intake or whatever it might be, um, it, if you ask for that support, you need to, you need to try and make sure that a support worker doesn't just assume that you're not capable of anything at all. So if I ask for, you know, advocacy support or a support worker, um, you know, for example, if there's washing, um, you know, I might want them to put my wash from take my washing out, put it on the line, but that doesn't mean they've automatically got the right to bring the washing that's already on the line in. Um, it's I, I think it's about setting boundaries. Um, and the perception that if you ask for support, that you you know you're not capable of anything else, like you you just completely surrender yourself to that person is not okay. It should be teamwork. It should be an effort. Um, and don't get me wrong, like I don't, I don't. I, those parents in in your question, I think should be consulted. You know, it is their kid. You know, they do have the right to express themselves. Um, I have mental health, so it's very important for me to be heard. Um, but I think it's about understanding why they say yes or why they say no. Um, yeah, it's a complicated situation, unfortunately, because. Unfortunately, because some people aren't capable of making their own decisions and because we are vulnerable, there is a crap ton of frameworks and policies and procedures and all that sort of stuff in place. Um, how about we just ask the question? Like if they need support and if they need to be protected, then we protect them. But that doesn't mean we should discredit how they feel or what they want to do. Um, yeah. I just feel like because we're so stigmatized and we've got so many protections or policies in place, we just we just have our hands tied behind our backs. And if we're not metaphorically handcuffed, then it's completely and utterly it's like pushing crap uphill. It's just an it's like climbing Mount Everest. It's never ending. Um, so yeah, Margaret. Yeah, look, um, thank yeah. you. Um, I'm. No I'm being very much on time watching the oh, good. Uh But I just want to finish to say uh, thank you so much to all the presenters. Um, just want to uh, say to people, co-designing with people from culturally diverse uh, with disabilities is so important. And 
also uh, uh, aware that lots of people talking to the parents, they forget to talk to the person themselves. The person themselves actually should be the first person organisations talk to. So I now close today's forum. I'm really sad to do that because it was such a rich uh, presentation and lots of discussion. I hope people walk away today much more aware of some of the stories that you've heard with presentations and much more in tune about that saying, nothing without us, without us. Thank you everybody for your time. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>